wondered, how does a woman end up becoming a competitive bodybuilder? And at what point does she decide to engage with performance enhancing drugs? And why? What influences her? What are her motivations? And how does being integrated into the bodybuilding community affect this? My name's Charlotte McLean, and I had all these questions before I completed my PhD within Liverpool John Morse University, looking at steroid and growth hormone use in female bodybuilders. And what I'm hoping to do today is provide you with an insight into my findings. In order to do this, I will start by providing a brief background on female bodybuilding, a consideration of some of the health implications of the use of steroids and growth hormone, thus situating this research within the public health domain, an overview of some of the aims and objectives of the study and the methodology I employed, and finally, an insight into the findings of my research. And in doing this, I hope to provide an illustration as to how one goes from recreational gym goer or indeed lay person to steroid using bodybuilder. And I'm going to illustrate this using three notions. Firstly, salvation, which describes in part the journey into bodybuilding. Faith, which is born from the integration into the community and the relationships formed there. And exoneration, the normalisation and justification of performance enhancing drug use within the sport and the wider bodybuilding community. Now, when you think of female bodybuilding, it might typically be an image like this that springs to mind. Indeed, this is the female bodybuilding division in perhaps one of the most prestigious competitions in the sport, the Olympia. Pictured here is Iris Kyle, who was very successful in this class. Now, over the years, there has been an increase in the number of categories in female bodybuilding, and all these display varying levels of muscularity. However, women can find themselves more heavily sanctioned than their male counterparts when it, when it comes to the degree of muscularity that is rewarded by the federations. And this is evidenced by the fact that the female bodybuilding class has been dropped from the Olympia since 2015. So what divisions might you expect to see at a show today? Well, different federations can sometimes have slightly different names, but broadly speaking, the categories are physique, body fitness, bikini, and more recently, wellness. I'm going to show you some examples of these now. Most of these are winners at the 2019 Olympia, so they are all professional athletes. OK, so here we have Shanique Grant of the physique division. So as you can see, this requires a significant degree of muscularity and a low body fat percentage. It's judged on four mandatory poses, shown here, as well as a round of quarter turns, which I'll come on to later. And the top six competitors selected will also get to do a 30 second routine of their choosing. You're judged on overall presentation. This does include hair, skin, makeup, tan and your stage presence what the IFBB like to term the total package. You'll notice in this division there's no footwear though. Moving on now, this is Sydney Gillian of the figure category, which is the pro divisions version of body fitness. So there's less muscularity than physique and a slightly softer look, slightly more body fat percentage. This is judged on quarter turns, shown here which will be the same as the physique class. However, instead of mandatory poses, competitors perform an eye walk, which involves walking to the end of the stage and back again. Again, you're judged on overall presentation, the total package. You'll notice there's footwear in this round. And in fact, federations are quite specific about heel height, type of footwear, and the bit the bikinis worn. So moving on then to bikini, and this is Elisa Pastini. So this is a softer, smoother look than body fitness, uh, much more of a commercial model look with slightly more muscularity. In this class, you would also perform the eye walk and the quarter turns. However, the posing is a little more feminine, hands on hips, etc. Again, judged on overall presentation, this is quite obviously it's quite a glamorous class. Now, more recently, the IFBB introduced the wellness category, and this sits somewhere between bikini and figure. 
It's for women who carry a little bit more body mass in their hips, glutes and thighs. So although the upper body is developed, it's sort of not in proportion with their lower body. Quarter turns and eye walk the same. And the conditioning and posing is largely based on bikini. OK, so there are a number of different federations that you can compete in as a bodybuilder. These are just a few of the key ones. So the International Federation of Bodybuilding and Fitness, the IFBB, is um, a pro division and you would accrue points here in order to qualify for the Olympia. If you're in the UK, you would become an IFBB pro by competing in the UK BFF, which is the UK Bodybuilding and Fitness Federation. NABA, which is the National Amateur Bodybuilders Association, would be your route to Mr. Universe. And then there are also federations that cater for natural bodybuilding, for example, the NBF, the British Natural Bodybuilding Federation, and the Natural Physique Association. These are some of the key ones. There are federations popping up all the time offering their own pro status. So what about performance enhancing drug use within the sport? Well, there may be a whole range of compounds used, and this all depends on the competitive phase of the athlete. For example, are they dieting or in the off-season? The division that they compete in, so how much muscularity is required, so body fitness, physique, more likely, but it's not unheard of in bikini. And of course, there are other influencing factors which I'll come on to later on. So my research focused on compounds used to increase muscularity, so steroids and growth hormone. And of course, such compounds are without risk or potential health implications. For example, steroids and growth hormone have been linked to cardiovascular, hepatic and psychological health concerns. Of course, for females, the androgenic effects can be particularly significant, especially those that are irreversible, such as enlargement of the voice, facial changes. And of course, we mustn't forget indirect harms such as risky injection practices, contamination of illicit market drugs, and dosage and labelling issues. At the outset of the PhD, I developed a number of key objectives in order to guide my research, and these are shown here. To illustrate these more succinctly, then, they included the nature and effects of use. So what compounds do women favour and why? How do they make these choices? Do they use oral or injectable compounds or a combination of the two? What side effects or health outcomes do they experience, be these positive or negative? What are the contributing factors? So this includes how one reaches the decision to become an assisted athlete. How competitive status and the influence of others impacts this? And finally, what role do significant life events have to play? Perceptions and attitudes. So this might include perceptions of risk, how people justify use, what is deemed acceptable use, and how performance enhancing drugs are perceived compared to more traditional psychoactives. And finally, engagement with medical professionals. Is use disclosed to the GP? Was this a positive or negative experience? And what other services have been accessed? And of course, all of this should be understood within a cultural context. I chose to use ethnography as the methodology for my research, as it's popular among researchers seeking to understand deviant subcultures and drug use. It allows the opportunity not only for participant observation, but through immersion, a route to understanding the lived experience of one's subjects. The methods I employed include participant observation within two gyms. One was local, which I attended on a weekly basis, and the other in southern England, which I visited on a number of occasions and had previous history with. I also conducted 11 one-to-one -one interviews with female bodybuilders, both previously and currently active. I also planned a photo elicitation element to the research, but due to time restrictions, this became more of a case study and provided me with supporting data. There was also a strong autoethnographic element to this research. So I was involved in the training and dietary strategies that bodybuilders employ. I attended bodybuilding events, both on my own as well as within gym groups. 
I was subject to a number of aesthetic evaluations for competition preparation, and of course, many informal conversations, all of which were recorded in a number of journals and field diaries along the way. So obviously with ethnography, one ends up with a good deal of data. So it's probably not possible for me to distill the complexity of bodybuilding culture and steroid use in women completely. However, in the next few slides, I will attempt to provide you with a flavour of my findings. Becoming a bodybuilder requires one to embark upon a significant body project to achieve the physique that the sport demands. In order to do this, you must engage in the rituals and practices of bodybuilding culture. And these can be quite consuming in terms of time and effort, going to the gym, preparing food, you may well alter your social occasions. It seeps into many areas of your life. In doing so, it has potential to distract a person away from other life events, and therefore it may provide a way of coping with negative situations, as well as being a means to transform your identity and finally achieve your physique goal. Although everyone I spoke with had a different story to tell concerning their own personal journey into bodybuilding, all of them fit broadly into one or more of these narratives, whereby bodybuilding offered salvation from an unruly body and life. These included the desire to change one's physical form, significant life events or experiences such as bereavements or illnesses, a career change, for example, moving into the fitness industry, a loss of identity when children are grown up, desiring a new focus or challenge. For some, bodybuilding was a redemption for the trappings of an eating disorder, whereby disordered eating practices and the pursuit of the thin ideal were alleviated through the quest for muscularity. So why bodybuilding? Well, all of my participants have been exposed to the sport in some way. Some have partners or family members involved in the sport and have attended bodybuilding competitions as a, as a result. Others were approached in the gym and asked if they'd thought of competing in bodybuilding. Some were inspired by the pages of bodybuilding magazines or other fitness profiles online. For me and others, it might be the gym that you happen to end up in. For example, I randomly started training at a bodybuilding gym because it was the most convenient one at the time. I was exposed to a good deal of hypermuscular bodies, including women. I started buying Muscle and Fitness magazine, and before I knew it, my ideal physique was in line with the bodybuilding cultural ideal. Bodybuilding offers salvation, and it also rewards those who successfully achieve the physique valued by the community and federations. I use boudoir to describe this. So, for instance, the achievement of the appropriate physique, i.e. physical capital, also results in social capital. So you gain a load of new friends, a whole community, maybe even a romantic partner. If you are successful in the sport, you will be validated by the community and gain cultural capital. If you are a coach working in the fitness industry, you will attract more clients, so more economic capital. I also noted a more contemporary form, virtual capital, in the form of likes, engagement, validation from a much wider community for your virtual avatar. So the notion of salvation also has clear religious connotations. And indeed, bodybuilding bestows the individual with a moral worthiness. This is echoed repeatedly in the mantras of bodybuilding and the cultural discourse that upholds the hard-working and dedicated individual who has adequately policed the organic desires of the body, overcoming hunger and pain, etc. So where do steroids and growth hormone come into this? Well, bodybuilding perpetuates the idea that one can have absolute control over one's physical appearance. The body is an object to be refined and perfected a possession that in a certain form becomes a valuable commodity. All that is required is to simply do the work to achieve the expected outcome by utilising the tools of the trade correctly, such that the reasons cited for using steroids and associated performance standards among women I spoke with was the desire to achieve a certain physique, to expedite their results and to be competitive on stage. Some, like myself, had trained naturally prior to this, but chose to transition to being an assisted athlete due to their inability to achieve their desired physique by any other means. Steroid use in this context 
is essentially a means to an end, a tool in the toolbox that assists in achieving the desired result. Now, of course, whatever strategy you have employed to reach and maintain your ideal physique, it's likely to be the one that you sustain. You therefore may feel somewhat dependent on steroids, as you fear the physique created with the assistance of these drugs will also be lost without them. Although, interestingly, this was something that stopped me from using. Bodybuilding, like mainstream culture, rewards the body aesthetic it deems most valuable. This can be in constant flux for women. Indeed, the muscular body that attracts the most capital is one that readily performs femininity, and it is often hypersexualized, devoid of adipose tissue, and not marked by AAS use. This does bed the question as to the degree to which bodybuilding offers any salvation from the expectations placed on women in modern consumer society. To be a successful bodybuilder, one must have faith. Trust the process is a common source of advice one might hear from peers as one struggles to adhere to the myriad of rules regarding diet, training and supplementation in a pursuit of physical perfection. And the coach can be an important figure and influence in this process. Indeed, the coach can represent the key to success for many. They are a godlike figure whose expertise and knowledge are upheld because of their position of authority within the wider bodybuilding field or gym. And this has been granted to them through the accrual of various capitals, cultural, social, physical, and increasingly virtual capital. And all of these hold far more credence than academic or industry qualifications. The coach's capability is therefore evidenced by their own and their clients' successful beliefs. And as such, their methods and ethnopharmacological knowledge is accepted, regardless of whether it fits with proven sports science or nutritional guidelines. Often the advice provided by coaches is dogmatic, such as the notion of clean eating, and this is really common in bodybuilding, and consists of the prescription of a restrictive diet consisting of a few allowable clean foods, often things like chicken, rice, sweet potato, oats. And because of course the term clean eating has no clear definition, these allowable foods may differ between coaches. However, what is clear is that one must adhere without question. Certainly, I've experienced situations online when to query any protocols can leave one open to the wrath of those who vehemently believe in its absolute efficacy. Indeed, it can feel a bit like querying someone's religious faith. As well as the delivery of dietary and training protocols, the coach can be an influential in the use of steroids. Many of the women I spoke with had taken advice and guidance on both the type and administration of steroids by coaches or those acting in a coach-like capacity, such as training partners or gym peers. Like the protocols of diet and training, this advice is trusted and accepted as simply another adjunct to the process of transforming one's physique. Having faith in the process requires one signs up for all of the necessary elements of the protocol. Such that when an extra pill must be swallowed, it is reasonable to see why many accept and trust that they are simply making another valid choice in order to ensure their success on stage. Furthermore, in many cases in my research, the coach also acted as a supplier, and hence any barriers related to obtaining the relevant compounds were removed and faith in their authenticity automatically assumed. Many of the women I spoke to had not considered that the advice they were being given might be suspect. With often no background knowledge, they had few benchmarks by which to make such judgments. Only with hindsight did some recognise that they had been recommended incorrect dosages or compounds for their training level or goals. However, this did not seem to erode their trust in the next coaching figure they employed or the nature of the source of the advice they listened to. As such a good deal of faith lies with the cultural authority figures, it is not surprising that many bodybuilders are reluctant to seek or heed advice from outsiders, especially the medical community. Of the women I spoke with, few had sought advice from the GP regarding steroid use and less directly concerned over a significant side effect. While some felt it was important to disclose under certain circumstances, many were reluctant to or had experienced a negative reaction.
In summary, faith and trust are required to become a bodybuilder. Faith in the process and trust in those cult members of the culture who are ordained with the authority to prescribe the necessary protocols for bodybuilding success. As we have seen thus far, the journey into bodybuilding involves integration into the community and with that the development of relationships that involve trust and faith in the process of becoming a bodybuilder, where steroid use is viewed as a means to an end, in order to be successful on stage. Alongside this may also come a gradual realisation that others in the field are also engaging in this behaviour and that within the context of competition, it's par for the course. Within bodybuilding culture, there exists an acceptable level of steroid use, and as long as you remain within these parameters, youth use is authorised and legitimised by the community as a normal and acceptable part of the protocols required for competition preparation. Use is therefore exonerated, and this legitimisation by the community allows one to retain the authenticity of one's physique achievements despite steroid use. However, at this point, I should note that this line between acceptable and unacceptable use can be narrower for women, when muscularity begins to push the boundaries of gender norms. I also noted in my research that many of the women I spoke with used similar vocabularies of motive to Monaghan's work when justifying their steroid use. These included self-fulfillment and constructive ra rationales. Here use is a legitimate means to an end, so steroid use is constructive and controlled, and particularly for women when it's for competition. Denial of injury. Many of the women I spoke to had experienced side effects, including androgenic effects, loss of menstruation, as well as some health-related issues. However, they did not view their steroid use as significantly injurious to their health, and these side effects were not considered enough to discontinue use. Appeals to normality. One example of this was someone likening their use to tanning or the use of Botox. Someone else compared it to taking a vitamin pill. Condemnation of condemners. This is directing attention to others' deviant behaviour in order to neutralise one's own. Examples of this are often, oh, I don't smoke or drink. And finally, one I noted, the relativising of use. So this involved women justifying their own use by comparing it to someone else's who had crossed their personally defined line into the extreme, usually defined through more significant virilization, often described like, oh, I don't like women who look like men, it's taking it too far. Ooh, I don't want to look like a man. So I'm going to finish there in the hope that I've provided you with at least some insight into the process of becoming a competitive female bodybuilder and how integration into bodybuilding culture can influence steroid uptake. Thank you very much for listening and does anybody have any questions?